Uh, before we finish, start with the last chapter which is back end. Let me complete what we were discussing last time about etching in VLSI and we discussed uh, the, we discussed last time about the wet etching and today uh, we will look into dry etching quickly and then go to back end. Uh, one of the problem which I said last time that if you are doing a wet etching, uh, most wet etchen, etchants are isotropic in their nature and when they etch, uh, they not only etch vertically down but also on the lateral side and that gives you whatever is your mass pattern, the etched area is more than what the mass actually was asking. Okay. Now the additional uh, both side area which is etched has been given a name B and it is called bias. And uh, if we look at this, this we have done last time, so I am just trying to be quickly on what we did. We did say that if this is larger, much bees are much larger so that the mask distance or width is uh, much, uh, the total film th which is etched is much larger than the mask width, then this is essentially a bad area. Uh, I may do little better etching in which less amount of lateral etching is done. So I will have a better uh, compared to this. However, ideally I want anisotropic etch in which whatever is the mask uh, width same is the etched area. Now we define an anisotropy term as AF which is 1 minus H rate in lateral direction upon H rate in vertical direction and uh, if you see if H rate of lateral is 0 that means nothing goes on the left side or right side then AF is 1. So the ideal etching, uh, ideal profile if you want then AF should be 1. But if our lateral is positive and sufficiently close to vertical, it can be 0 0.1 to 0 0.1 is the value of AF can vary. Smaller the AF, worst is the uh, dimension you are getting and larger the AF, better dimensions are what exactly mask wants we are transferring. Now this proportional if you need H rate is into time is equal to the distance B on the lateral side and on the D which is the depth of the film which is R vertical into T. So essentially what I am saying that AF is 1 minus B by D, okay. So if this is the film thickness, this is the bias and AF decides how much is the value AF you are getting. D is the film thickness vertically down, B is the bias lateral. So B by D is essentially 1 minus B by D is the uh, anisotropy coefficient and we are expecting that to be as close to 1 as possible. There is little maths I did, of course this is given in uh, plumber, uh, so you may even see later. Here is something what a pattern looks like, this SM is the mask size you want to etch below that, okay. This is another mass area and in between is the distance X which is going to be etched, okay. Between the mask edges, the distance is x which is where the etching is going to be done, okay. So we now define some terms. If this is my edge profiles on both side of x, I define the term SF as the film width which is taken from edge of this mask to the edge of the other mask. It's called pitch of that. This is the total width. Please look at it from this point to this point is 2 SF, okay. SF is the film thick shown here, SF is whatever is the this much part. So from here to here it is 2 SF, this is your SM, this is your B, this is your B. So if I do little maths on these, one can say 2 SF minus SM <coughs> is the H to H mass distance X which is what we are etching actually, X is what we are etching. We also see SM is SF plus 2B, BB, so SM plus 2B, please remember SM minus 2B is the SF. What is SF? Is the film width which you actually etch, H to H. So SM is SF plus 2B. We do little calculation again as we did for AF, we will come back to this letter. AF is equal to 1 minus B by X film thickness, D we wrote but here it is, I said it is XF. 
So B upon XF 1 minus of that is AF. So B by XF is 1 minus AF. So B is XF into 1 minus AF. This simple maths. I will come back to it. SF is the distance shown here. Okay. So you calculate that will be 2 SF. So x is equal to the, when I if I derive b is equal to xf 1 minus af, I substitute back in this equation sf plus 2b. So I write sm is equal to sf plus xf 1 minus af into 2. This equation has been now reduced to this or rather expanded to this. And then from here I can get a value of x which is 2sf minus sm is x, 2sf minus sm, sm is this expression. So if I write this, I get the expression of xf, x is equal to sf minus 2xf 1 minus af. What is that we are trying to say from this? What is the ideal etching we are looking for? sf should be same as x, sf should be same as x. So if af is equal to 1, x is exactly what h to h you want, same etching it will go. If it is not so, then whatever you wanted actually it will be different from it will be larger than x and something additional window will be opening okay. Now this film thickness which uh, so one can see from here if I write this sf is x plus 2 xf this formula I can make sf equal to x in what conditions 1 is af equal to 1 the what is other possibility if the xf is 0 or smaller or thinner, smaller the xf, but that is obvious if the film thickness is very low, the lateral etching will not have enough time to really go deeper. So essentially we are saying if the film is thin, then it is not that great to get x equal to sf, but the film is thicker, then the lateral etching will happen and then x will not be same as sf. So possibility is that x is equal to sf is very unlikely unless I make af equal to 1 which in most cases will be very very difficult but we will try I may get af is up to 0.8 to 0.9 one can get but never we can get 1 some lateral etching will happen okay. Why it can happen even if something is going down at the edges it will hit something called at the edge there is a field they say. So ions will be pushed even inside a bit of them. So there will be additional B always will be there which will not be 0. So AF can never become, so the figure which we draw last time, this is only ideal figure that AF is equal to 1 which is very unlikely to attain. Now why we are worried about because the people who design the mask, they will design with the, S, they have two parameters SM and X. H to H what is the distance between the mask and the mask window size itself. They have fixed it but now you are going to etch it and you say okay the actual film thick you, thickness which you etched actually giving larger than what uh, X wanted that means you have erred in there because there is a next device may come closer to it. It may happen both device may merge in some cases because etching may overtake the other side also. So such a situation we want to avoid. So what you are telling the de designer, oh keep at least away this much, this is called design rule. Okay. We are actually telling them, hey do not, we may never get one, so go at least this distance. But at least larger the distance I ask them to go, what does that mean? The area of the chip will start increasing for the same function. So a designer, his whole effort is to see making it compact as much transistors and interconnect I can push per unit area, that is my aim. And now you are going to tell, oh I have a problem. So the technology must try to achieve as good AF as is possible and one possible mechanism in which this is done is using what is called as reactive ion etching. So what is our ultimate aim? I repeat X equal to SF is what we are looking for, okay, film whatever width etched the same should be the edge to edge mask which is window for us. So what is the reactive ion HR? A reactive ion HR, this of course is this formulation is given in book so there is uh, no great thing I am talking about. Can you see this figure slightly different from the plasma depression system I made? 
Yes, in this case the wafers are connected to RF source and the top plate is essentially grounded. In other cases what was there? The source was here and whatever is the target was kept here, okay. Is that clear? So, wafers are now target and the upper is grounded plate, okay. Now, one can see from here the way it happens. If I apply RF plasma RF across anode and cathode, the gas may be discharged because of the field is large enough. However, if you see ions and electrons, electrons are more mobile compared to ions. Ions are heavier mass, their velocities will be smaller. Electrons are lighter, they will move faster. So it may happen that electrons may first hit the cathode or the plates, uh, substrates earlier than ions can come and they may actually charge the substrate by negative charge. Is that correct? That is why that cathode potential higher was shown because cathode may become much more negatively charged. Is that clear to you? But since some electrons are left this from the plasma, but there is still not all electrons are left there. So this is still a plasma, but now it becomes little more positive because negative electrons are left. Therefore, if you see other day figure, there is a plasma potential positive shown to you. Is that clear? Now it is clear because faster electrons move out, some of them by the time they absorb and second electron start, the plasma gets into by the time the RF frequency allows it to go opposite polarity. So this charge plasma getting positive charge with reference to cathode is very dominant effect which allows now whatever is the plasma ions, they will be accelerated by the field across this and will hit the substrate. Is that correct? will hit the substrate. The resist normally stops many of these ions like ion, bombard, ion uh, implantation we see uh, resist actually can, etch, uh, can stop most of the ions. In this case also if you have resist there during etching, ions cannot remove resist but wherever is the window developed, ions can get inside. Is that clear? And they will hit whatever film there may be SiO2, nitride or metal or any film which is there it will start attacking it. Now there are two possibilities exist in this. If the gas which I use is not just argon or some kind of a neutral gas, okay. If let us say I use a gas which is freon, okay, CF4 or whatever equal to and uh, it may release fluorine ions, okay. For fluorine at least for silicon dioxide, silicon nitride and in some metals as well, fluorine attacks very heavily. What is this reaction will be? Chemical reactions. Fluorine is actually chemically reacting the film down. But at the same time, the fluorine ions are moving in which direction? Vertically downward because of what? Because of the electric field sets in there, okay. So ions are accelerated, but they are active, they are charged and also they are reactive to the film itself. So this is what kind of etching we are doing, chemical as well as ionic, is that correct? What the two kind of etching I did, chemical etching because fluorine is attacking as well as the bombardment is done which is causing uh, energy to hit the target and remove that from the like a sputtering. So you have two processes going on in the case of reacting ion etching, the reaction is taking place from the chemicals and bombardment is taking because of ion being energetic vertically going down. Is that correct? If I only use argon, then what will be called sputterage because then there is no reaction between argon and this. So that is the difference between sputterage and RIE. The only diff difference is I say the re gas used is reactive kind. If you look at the, without going into too detail of chemistry, look for yourself. A freon gas, when it picks up an electron, it becomes CF3 plus fluorine plus electron. Then CF3 plus electron is this, CF3 plus Fe minus CF4. This is called three step process called dissociation, ionization, recombination. And because of this, fluorine ions actually travel down, react with the film below. And also since they are vertically down, they also hit ion energy is given. So they also do sputtering 
So, there are two mechanisms going on in etching. What is the first? Fluorine reaction and second bombardment of fluorine ions. Okay. These two mechanisms lead to additional H rate. Please look at it. There are two H rates now going on. One essentially because of the reaction, the other because of ionic bombardment. Is that clear to you? So, normal RIE has two kinds of agents etching mechanisms which we must model in case we want to find the actual H rate. However, many times uh, I am not very keen to have bombardment. I am not really ready, I am not really looking for anisotropy. Where do you think I do not need anisotropy etching, during etching? After I do lithography, I develop the pattern, then I do RI etching. Okay. But what is now left after etching? The resist everywhere. But that I am not etching selectively. I want to remove etching as photoresist everywhere. Is that correct? I am trying to remove photoresist everywhere. This is called ashing. Okay. This is called ashing. So I want to remove the photoresist. Okay. For that, doing this, I do not really need ions for that. I need, I mean, I do not need directional ions. I only need fluorine to be available or something else to be available which can etch photoresist. So, oxygen plasma is good enough without any direction, it can remove the resist. This is called ashing, and here is an you have written down these reactions. So, these are also given, of course, I do not know about in plumber, but in every etching book you can see this same reactions. Which gas is now banned in the Freon is banned gas now. Okay, so which gas is used in air conditioning? Which gas is used? Even chlorine is now getting banned. So now the gas probably is going to use is S2F6, uh, which is also used in some power electronics. Which is what are those called? Contactors. Okay, so there vacuum arc system. If you go and look at in power system. We are using now SF6 discharge, SF6 discharge. Okay. okay, this is just additional information. Now, no one is using Freon, but uh, I think many VLSI companies are still using Freon and not telling probably. Okay. okay, this equations are clear. Is that two mechanisms are clear? Is that two mechanisms clear in RIE? One bombardment, other chemical reaction. So, this, this please this sentence you may, uh, it is not non reactive, it is a reactive species of fluorine is used, can be used, no is not, but need not be fluorine, any other species. Now, this is a isotropic etching, why it is called isotropic? Because it is not directional or it can etch any direction, it does not, I want to remove every place anyway, and it is used in ashing of resist using oxygen plasma. So, here is a reactor which is called a very famous reactor, actually, that is how we started with. It is called barrel reactor. Uh, this is the end view and this is the side view of the re reactor. You can see from here there is a boat on which wafers are kept. Okay. Then between these two plates we apply RF. This is you know one plate, this is your other plate anode cathode. This is the RF applied. I enter the gas. The most important difference before you draw a figure you see this. There is a small some wired mesh I have kept there. Is that clear? This, this is a wired mesh, okay, which is essentially is grounded, not really shown correctly. This sh shield is, it's called shield. So a shield is all around the wafers. That means shield is all around the wafer. This is a shield. So wafers sit inside the shield and shield is grounded. So when I get a discharge, ions will be created which are positive plus charge ions. However, this, when they pass through shield, they will lose their charge to the shield. So, what is left there is only say oxygen plasma is used. So, only oxygen atoms which are not necessarily charged, some of course, some will still pass through, but few of them, most of them will be only oxygen. And this is O. Why O? Because the reaction I am using in a plasma, I am not getting O2. So, what is the difference between O2 and O? Nascent oxygen is highly reactive okay, because it does not get a bond, so it starts reacting. That oxygen then reacts with 
any photoresist carbon material and will convert into carbon dioxide, okay, which is exhausted out and the whole vapor is cleaned out. Okay. So, this HRs are only used for photoresist ashing or some film where you want to remove all the films across. Okay. So, this is another etching which is used, this is dry etching, the other is also dry etching, but what is the difference there? It is reactive as well, in this case it is only reactive, but it is not bombardment, is that correct? Reactive ion, here only reactive species, is that correct? That is the only difference between the two H systems. The first one we said it has two possibilities, one is plasma ion bombardment, other is etching. So, I want to create a model based on this mechanism. For RI, there are two possible mechanism etching, one as I said related to chemical etching, the other is ion bombardment. Is that okay, figure is drawn? This, this figure is also so very popular. Uh, also, you can go to applied materials lab, they have one barrel etcher kept corner. So, there are two possible mechanisms, uh, two possible models are created for displaying, uh, describing the etching in the plasma systems. Okay. Which one? Oh, this is RF coil. Also, you know, this, there is a coil diffuser. Uh, Sorry, this may coils are little ahead, but below there is a diffuser. That means there is a circular plate and holes in. This is called diffuser. Why? Because gas, if it comes from one end, it will be heavily pushing on one end only. So it actually allows you to gas go through number of holes so that everywhere plasma pressure is constant. Is that clear? If I push gas from all sides everywhere, the plasma pressure is uniform. Okay. So that's why it is. But just above this is the shield, uh, is the RF coil, just above that. Because you know, otherwise the gas which is coming here, this plasma will be less ions than this plasma. Okay, so I want uniform plasma. So I want to push gas everywhere. Okay. Is that clear? The two models which allows you to model the etching is linear etch model and saturation adsorption model for RI, is called RI. The first model, both are for RI, I think I made a mistake, but a linear H model says it assumes, assume, assumes something. Yes, we have said two mechanisms, chemical and ionic. However, our assumption is during the etching, they independently react. They do not interact with each other. One is happening, other is also happening and they are like a superposition, okay. So we say chemical and ionic components in plasma etching independently act and superimpose in the result. Then the H rate can be given as 1 due to the chemical reaction and 1 due to the ionic reaction or ionic bombardment. So we figured out this model is given and can be derived also, but I just wrote down. There is a term called SC, KF, FC by N plus Ki Fy by N, where F stands for flux in all cases. Okay. So Fc is the available gas flux. What is flux is? Number of atoms per unit area per unit time, which is decided by what? The pressure of the gas inside, flux is decided by the pressure of the gas inside. Okay. So I know Fc, how much gas pressure I use, I know fluxes of this. Kf is essentially is called rate reaction constant due to chemistry. Whatever is the reaction rate between the species as well as to the substrate which you are reaching. Sc is called sticking coefficient. Okay, we'll discuss this little later. And n is the number of atoms or number density per cc of the film. So whichever film you are there, but like in silicon, what is the n number? 5 into 10 to power 22 per cc. For different materials, this number will be different. Okay. In looking at this side, for ionic, Ki is the reaction rate due to ion flux, rate constant, and Fi is the ionic flux at each point on the surface. Now, why this word Sc has been introduced in the first case? Because the chemical reaction can only take place if the incoming atom actually stays on the surface. 
you know it has to react so it must stay there okay because it will it will stay and it start moving and then can they go in it also okay so as long as it sticks there only then it can edge so the coefficient we describe this sticking possibility which overcome the surface energy is called sticking coefficient okay for different materials and different gases scs are different typically sc all atom getting attached may sc is 1 none is getting attached may sc is 0 So SC, remember, typically between zero and one can be as high as 0.5 in most cases. Never one. Not all atoms stick. Partly they move and emit also. Okay. So SC is not more than 0.5, but certainly not very small number either. Okay. So if I know now FC days and I know KF KI for the film I am etching, for the uh, flux I am using, then I know my H rate. I know my H rate due to what? are i reactive as well as bombardment total h rate is this if i multiply it by time then what i'll get is film thickness okay so if given a film thickness i want to etch in certain time i know how much should be h rate and depending on h rate i can find what fluxes i should use so or pressures i should keep so that this film can be etched in this much time is that clear this is how Back calculations are performed. First, you are asked: This is a this film should be AF should be one close to one. This I want. This I want. So you have to back calculate and come and find how much should be the gas pressure. Okay, that is how we adjust the gas pressure. What is the other method? Keep on changing the wall. Maybe take hundred readings. Some day it will hit correct. Okay. Okay. So. please remember vertical etching is in which direction uh, uh, vertical etching is because of which mechanism both chemical as well as ionic but lateral will be because of what only chemical ions can have. of course few ions do scatter but generally most of it will be chemical etching in this model we say vertical etching is due to only chemical and ionic processes however etching is lateral direction one can say that only chemical reaction occurs as ions travel mostly in vertical directions and in that case to get the lateral etching what should i do h rate put fi equal to 0 no flux due to ions on the lateral side so i can get lateral is that clear How to get lateral H rate? Just make F I equal to zero. Okay. This was one model suggested, which worked reasonably well in many cases. But it was our assumption was both processes are independent itself is not correct. Okay. Uh, firstly, because when the ions come, uh, our assumption is mean free path is sufficient; they don't scatter. But it does not happen. They hit the walls and they actually release electrons. Which actually takes the energy from the ions, so their direction changes. So the at the end, one cannot say guaranteedly that everything is coming only down. Some ionic concentration may go on the lateral side as well because of both acting together and affecting each other. Okay, this is our first assumption we said, but in reality it may not happen. If that happens, that both are acting together. Uh, one can derive little sim similar fashion. H rate is one upon n, one upon K I F I plus one upon S C F C, and uh, this uh, this model has fitted well in some gases, particularly fluorine based, but did not fit in the other gases etchings. So one doesn't know whether this model is correct. This model is correct. Whichever fitted to your data, we may say this model in our case is correct. so it is a fitting data model which we did enough etchings and we figured out uh, typically which model normally reacts okay but this has more chances of fitting why because it's assuming both together okay reaction of each other on both sides so there is a possibility but modeling a scattered ions is very not very easy scattering scattering ions okay so this becomes only a first order equivalence and therefore not very accurate but otherwise this at least takes care of interactions okay so this finishes the possibilities of etching any film uh, what was the etching we did first we did wet etching and then we said dry etching 
So why do you want to prefer dry etching, selective etching and anisotropic etching? Why selective? Because one finds that different gases, wet etchings can lift many things. What happens? If there is a film and there is a window, the solution goes in and from the corner it may go in okay, and then lift the film, upper film which is stopping actually. So the worries are in wet etching is solutions are what kind of socialistic in their thinking. They do not uh, think that this I have to go, I have not to go, they go everywhere. Whereas these are more capitalistic people, they go vertically or wherever they want and therefore they are much more accurate. Okay and much more not much more uh, less clumsier films than anything. However, what is the problem with ion etchings? Ions are sufficient energy. So they are hitting what? During etching the lower surface will be damaged surface. So you will have to recover that damage. So you have to anneal that means one thermal budget you have increased. Is that clear? So it is not at free cost. Firstly, you have to take it away, clean it, redo it this and again you have to put extra thermal budget for actually getting this better film uh, etching. Okay. Is that okay? So nothing at zero cost. Okay. okay so this finishes etching. Uh, so the last part of this course which should have taken more efforts than what I am doing today. Uh, as I said, the back end engineers are the ones who make the chip success system success and therefore should be really looked into much deeper. But since they overlap with the designers, so one feels whether designer should teach this part or a technology part. So I am only going to talk about that part in which technology effort is required, the designers are the ones who decide what I should do. Okay. So what, what is back end? Essentially back end means. The first one or two layers of metal which are from the devices or to first interconnect as we call may be part of the front end process. Okay. Anything above this as number of layers of interconnect layers you create, these are called back end, layer, back end technologies. Why? Because they decide the interconnect for the chip. Typically how much is the length of the interconnect on a good Intel chip I said you 5 kilometers on 1.7 centimeter size chip. Okay. So one can think the one which is going to decide everything for you, I am finishing in 10-20 minutes. Okay. Though actually it should demand that at least 8-6 hours I should spend only on back ends because these are the ones which will make chip fail. Everything goes well till front end and chip fails and the back end. Okay. So issues which are very worrying are back end issues. But as I say, I am not going to spend time though I wish I could. So back end technology in IC fabrication refers to metal layers above first metal layer which leads to interconnects. And as I say these days 6 or 7 layers of interconnects are even 9 have been tried now uh, for a more complex circuit. So these are uh, essentially what, so what are the problems in creating number of interconnecting metal layers? I have to talk about contacts. I must talk about vias through which this something goes down okay. and of course then between the two metal layers I need a dielectric which separates this inter metal layers interconnect lines. So when I say I am looking for back end, I am looking for contacts, I am looking for vias and I am looking for intermetallic dielectrics. Of course root is wrong. So how do you place devices or transistors and how do you interconnect is another game. Typically if you are a circuit man they will say the, there should be something called local, something called global interconnect. The local interconnects are close to the device source drains, these are called local interconnects. Anything away outside that is called global interconnect. Now we keep saying some should be synchronous to the clock, some should be non-synchronous to be clock. Okay. So these are issues which circuit people are worried about because to maintain certain speed of uh, particular processor or any circuit, these are called globally asynchronous and locally synchronous is what is one tries in most cases GALS is the technology which used globally asynchronous. Please remember in circuits asynchronous does not mean clock 0, okay. it is not synchronous with the system clock. 
So, interconnects run at different frequencies and actual device runs, first interconnect runs with some other frequency which is synchronous to the actual system clock. So, okay. So, please remember where do you keep your devices and how do you interconnect on so many layers is another software possible. It is called place and root, but with many layers of metal, it becomes very, very difficult for even place and root to get smallest amount of delay, which is uh, what we are really looking for. There can be multiple choices. Okay. So, here is why we start interacting with designers. Now, an interconnect, which is a metal line on a dielectric, is like an RLC circuit. Typically, we always believe it is RC circuit. For a great amount of research we did for many years, that was sufficient. That is typically around few gigahertz. A metal line on a dielectric can be thought as R and C. How, how, what is I am saying? Trans, this is only RC transmission line. So, most of the time we calculated using uh, simple for Elmore's formula or others or actually solving the transmission line, the delay of this line and we say that is the delay we are worried about. Okay. However, now the metal itself is becoming thinner because of scaling and uh, the voltage, I mean the frequencies are increasing. So, a simple wire is not a resistor alone. Okay, it may actually have now <coughs> inductor along with the resistor. Okay, so a circuit trans of a transmission line is now more like a RLC. There is also R across C now because of the capacitors are not ideal capacitors. So the kind of lossy transmission line network solving is what is now needed if I want to find a delay in a interconnect. Now this delay has a problem. Uh, if you look at a very simple RC model, larger the length of interconnect I run, larger is the R. C may be area wise also C increasing, but R is also increasing. So, if I take a signal from one end to other in a longer line, the RC delays will be larger. And if this 1 upon RC is the same as your system clock or close to that, it will actually be 1 may actually become 0 by that actually clock age, okay, equivalently saying because you are getting 1 phase out because you are delay of 1 cycle. This essentially means your whole data transfer will be actually RE. Okay. So, we must see to it that this RC delays or RLC delay should be much smaller than the actual system clock I am running. That is why that asynchronous can we do not want to run at all the highest frequencies. Okay. That is why we may globally we want to go asynchronous. So, this idea that RC should be reduced uh, essentially if you look at the time constant associated with delay tau L, larger the area, larger is the tau L, smallest the feature size. If this feature size is small, it is film size, feature size square, inversely it goes to delay. So, if you are working on 11 nanometers, actually the RC delays are much longer, okay, because everything is thinning down, okay. So, actually my delay become worsened if I go from 45 to 30, 32 to 22 to 16, 11, the delay is even worse. So, I will have to do additional features to see that delay is avoided. It also depends upon intermetallic distance and the dielectric you keep, so kiox and it also depends on the metal resistivity. So, should I use aluminum at all now? Okay. So, I may use for which are the better resist, uh, smaller resistivity, so copper for example. So, these are the area when I look for high performance circuit, I must see to it that I conform to a circuit performance. Why I am worried about? Because device people always believe that they have made soul drain they have made channel lengths. So, what everything what you wanted I have given you, okay. that is what the front end people feel. Okay. But the problem starts afterwards, the circuit does not work, each start blaming oh, your this was your problem, this one that. But at the end, the, the money who person who put the money he lost it, okay. so he is more worried. 
So one e issue which you must not forget that the back end design is very, very crucial. So how do I put interconnect? I suggest technology which metals I should need, what is the delay maximum I expect from you, okay. All these issues, of course I, if you do not do it, I will put buffers after every small length of interconnect, I will put a buffer which will reduce my delay, okay. However, buffer means I consume power, I put extra area, area and everywhere I have only buffers, okay. okay. So that is not the, of course circuit person will say I will get you out, okay, but that is not the best solution. Yeah, large size, large size and it should be, it is called non-inverting inverter. Uh, in the sense, epsilon by this. C, C is proportional to K, okay. Oh, but we are not going for gate. That, that is what I am trying to say. You are, all this time I have said you Ramayana. Now do not go Ram and Sita, okay. We are outside device now, okay. We are only in the interconnects, okay. The dis, dielectric between two metal lines need not be high K. If that happens, it is the worst thing to happen. Oxide does not mean silicon dioxide, insulator, okay, in general. For all these years, even now, the first layer still can be an aluminum as a contact and then as an interconnect. What is the difference between contact and interconnect? Contact is with the source drain, okay. So it can be a contact material, but the line running need not be aluminum. So it, but earlier, we used to run aluminum as a, con, um, run as an interconnect as well as for the contact. Uh, why aluminum was so preferred material? There are many reasons why we started with aluminum. First of course, if you only look for conductivity, then aluminum has delayed 5 to the power minus 5 ohm per ohm centimeter is the, uh, most per centimeter is the conductivity. So very low, okay. So what is wrong with aluminum? Fantastic. Aluminum has all good features, okay, which one wanted. But it is still not the best conductor. Copper is still better conductivity than aluminum. Gold and silver are also equally good. But somehow in India or abroad, anywhere, if you talk about gold, everyone fears as if it is very costly. In fact, platinum which is very often is costly, much costlier than gold. But when it comes to it, gold is very costly. So the gold technology is never preferred for not being costly. Gold is very bad conduct, uh, bad trap center creator in silicon. It gives amphoteric means one level is above the lower which should be opposite side. The acceptor is above the donor which gives huge amount of trapping, okay. And that is essentially killing the lifetime. That is what used actually for killing the lifetime. So gold I do not want to come. Silver get oxidized without doing anything, it just sees it and blackens, okay. So left is aluminum, so people worked on aluminum. Then why not copper? Copper also get oxidized, one is there. Secondly, copper also has a uh, trap level in the silicon, okay. So in my time, we never used a copper line of gases because which is very good to run, all gases should pass through good conducting gas lines, but we never used it because copper was anthema. Oh, it may kill all my devices, okay. May or may not happen, but we always were worried that copper should not be used within 100 meters of the lab, okay. No copper tubings. Now, yeah, you also found the oxide. yeah, but that, that's the fantastic part. Aluminum on the top layer it forms, but the lower layer it does not form. That's called anodization. That it protects the aluminum is only thing which it does. Whereas copper oxide, it actually pours down to all the films, okay. You have a point. Aluminum has all the features which you wanted actually. Protection, take a layer oxide a gaya. Niche to metal hi hai. Is that clear? So aluminum has all good features. Why we went from aluminum was that RC delay. Someone said R, R, R. Then we started looking for better conductivity material, okay. That is the reason. Typically aluminum has many advantages of silicon technology. Aluminum silicon alloy is formed around 450 degrees, it is called eutectic. So aluminum silicon forms alloy is around 450 degrees, even lower 423 of 3 itself, but 450 most of it forms alloy. Also 
aluminum is a dopant in silicon type 3. Okay. So, at least on P it will make P plus. So, good homicity it can create, okay. it is fantastic. It has a good very low temperature it can form a contact alloy between silicon and aluminum. Please remember alloy means better contact, same uni uniformity. So, I can this is something contact I should say if a normal metal semiconductor junction which is called Schottky barrier if I plot IV this dotted line is normal metal semiconductor ba uh, Schottky barriers. Whereas the kind of contact I am looking or ohmic uh, contact I am looking should be very low resistance both in forward bias as well as in reverse bias. So almost ideally I want like this 0 resistance but that is not possible. So close to that as low as possible this is what I am trying to achieve. So silicon and aluminum forms a good alloy, aluminum is a type 3 dopant. So it will give even better contact resistance or lower contact resistance and therefore more likely to give me more ohmic contact. So no voltage drop at these contacts. What is the problem if the voltage drop goes on the contact? If source drain has additional voltage drops, so the delay increases because for the channel VDS decreases. Okay. So I am trying to see that my source drain contacts have least voltage drops. So then itself will have some drop but this is additional when that there is an area with it. The line may run longer, much more area may create. So I somehow wish to avoid the this part very clearly. So I want to make good omicity. Okay. However, gold I mean aluminum has its own problems. One of the major worries with uh, aluminum as was found was when I made a aluminum contact to source on drain, uh, this is my aluminum and this is my N plus silicon, N silicon or whatever it is. Please remember silicon has also solubility in aluminum and aluminum has a solubility in silicon. Is that clear? This is called phase diagram. Aluminum dissolves in silicon and silicon dissolves in aluminum. So, Around 450 itself, aluminum has a silicon has sufficient diffusivity in aluminum. So, what happens when you start annealing for allowing the contact? Part of the silicon actually comes into aluminum. Okay, it creates voids because alum, silicon gone from there. Aluminum tries to diffuse down because it finds voids and silicon down, so it comes down. So, you have aluminum contact to the substrate. This is called junction pitting. So why source drain gone? Is that clear? The top contact is to the substrate, no source drain. Of course, this is not that everywhere it will happen, but additional resistance certainly will occur and there will be an issue which sometimes circuit may not even function. Is that clear? So the worries are of junction pitting is actual when it will not have occur if source drains are deeper. In my time, we had 3 micron source drains. Aluminum film was hardly 1000 to 2000 Armstrongs. So, it was very unlikely that it will go to 3 micron deep. So, I mean, never saw junction pitting in earlier times. But when I source then become 1000 Armstrongs, then this pitting is very, very possible. Okay. So, currently, so you can see scaling has actually created reliability issue, it gives a pitting problem. Uh, 450 anneal has to be done to make an alloy between aluminum and silicon. It is a eutectic. If I come from aluminum this to silicon this at 450 they will form alloy. Look for a phase diagram. Okay. okay. So is that point clear? So first major worry in a back end is that if you make aluminum contacts everywhere with the current scale down devices, this issue may actually hurt you. So, so what should I do? Between aluminum and silicon, I should put something in between which will not allow aluminum or silicon to cross diffuse. That is called barrier. Titanium nitride is a good barrier layer, okay. but it is certainly not as good a contact to silicon nor as good a contact to aluminum. So, 
normally thin titanium nitride layer is essentially interposed between silicon and aluminum layer just to make it barrier to for interdiffusions. Okay. It is also called buffer layer okay, in some books, but most VLSI people call it barrier. If you are noted down, there is another effect. Of course, there is a third effect I forgot, but maybe I will say. The present day tendency is to actually give some stresses to the silicon device. What for we want to stress the device? Anyone? Mobility enhancement by compressive and by tensile, one of the mobility could be enhanced. So, we are now really trying to shrink the device and trying to even create stresses. Okay. Now, this compressive stress in particular is very harmful for aluminum actually. If aluminum line is running and this structure is similar shown here and it receives because the device is under compressive stress, part of the aluminum actually. Please remember aluminum is a metal is not crystalline. What is the form of metal? All metals are amorphous or polycrystalline at best poly or mostly amorphous. Okay. Now there is already grain boundaries in the polycrystallines. Now what happens when the metal is running over the side to layer due to the grain boundary diffusions or movements some aluminum moves away from its position and actually climbs over one and actually break the contact between the, so it is a hillock formation which actually one can see in an under an SEM. It is not a very, even normal 100x to 10x uh, microscope you can see this hillock okay, and a breakage of contacts. The similar effect if not same is also seen by electro migrations. What is electro migration I said? If in the metal layer huge current density is applied 10 to the power 5 m per centimeter square, then the number of electrons ions are very large there. This number per unit area is called electron wind. Electrons are more mobile, so they try to move away and this movement of electrons causes a force and if aluminum ions or atoms there cannot stand to this force, then they come, jump. Okay. Similar like they jump and that is called electro migration. If you put titanium nitride that itself will stop it because the electro migration coefficient of nitride is much lower compared to what is for aluminum. Okay. So copper is the best for electro migration. It is not easy for copper is more metallic than aluminum in grain boundary system. So it does not climb so easily. So current, higher currents can easily be taken by copper compared to aluminum. Copper has better conductivity. So now we are started thinking ke aluminum ko chhodna kya yahan se aaya. So we start looking for this. Uh, to give some history on this, uh, the copper technology was first tried uh, by Texas instrument and uh, of course there is a word of course, maybe I will come back to it. For lower resistance interconnect per unit length aluminum is replaced now by copper in upper layers at least. Copper is a trap giving impurity in silicon I just said okay and hence needs again separation between anything to silicon it must get separated. So what should I need between copper and this? some kind of a barrier and that a wherever copper is going it should be surrounded by that barrier material. So what is the surrounding system should be called in fiber what do we call? Cladding. cladding. So all copper lines or copper this must be cladded by titanium nitride or some other barrier material. So tantalum based alloys or vanadium based oxides, nitrides sometimes both or titanium nitrides are excellent cladding materials and they are normally surrounding copper lines. Okay. Just to give a history, copper interconnect process was invented by, claimed by, I do not know whether they invented but they claim they are patents both by IBM and Texas instrument around the year 98. 
And the interesting part why they did it that by just replacing aluminum by copper, at least the three upper layer interconnects, they found their circuit started speeding up by one and a half times without no architectural change, no dimensions on anything, just putting copper layers, they figured out the speed to one and a half times. So, 3 gigahertz processor or in those days of course 2.1 gigahertz suddenly became 3 gigahertz processor for doing nothing except this new process. So that is why copper has replaced at least for top interconnects. That is decided by the technology films. Films are decided by technology people. Typically, VRs are of the order of 0.2 microns, I uh, mean 1000 Armstrong. So only that much copper lines can run. No, vanadium X is not We have plug. Ka. No, 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 no. It is not circular. I will show you a plug. Instead of plug, a tungsten ka plug, there is a copper plug. Let us say I want between the two metal layers connection. Okay. So I drill a hole through inter oxide and connect top portion to the lower. But can I connect with the same upper metal down? So they, that I do not want to do. I want guaranteed contact from upper layer to the lower layer. So I create a via. Which should be which, which process will create vias? Ri because I want vertically dimensioned H. Okay. Then I will put some material in between, which is conducting and easy to flow in this, so that it fills up that via. Okay. This is called plug. This is called plug, which fills up that via. Okay. So I, how do I create a plug? Let's say I have an oxide. I open a window. Then I deposit titanium nitride first. I open a window by lithography and I actually create titanium nitride, okay, film on that which is by CVD. And then I deposit tungsten either by CVD or even by sputtering but normally by CVD. Yes, WF6 is the gas which is used tungsten hexafluoride and that gas is passed through because in CVD what is the thing I kept on saying? It is, it will follow all the contours of the wafer conformal and therefore it will, if this is like this copper will also, I mean the tungsten will also flow this. Okay. So I deposited tungsten sufficiently thicker than the via itself. So you can see from here some thicker metal was deposited okay, in the all portions other than this. Okay. Then this thickness may be you know many times the upper layer is deposited by sputtering. The first you do CVD and then just deposit dump by sputtering so that I do not have to worry about doing the once it has come up I deposit even thicker on that. Okay. Is that okay? 1, 2, 3. Then I do little etching of the tungsten, it is called etch back. This is a very important process, how much to reduce tungsten, okay. Because the next process which we are going to do is our chemical mechanical polish and one very thick layers cannot be polished out. So I had to reduce that tungsten thickness, okay. Earlier I did not know I put sputtering, I put some large numbers. So then I monitored it and say okay at least 80 percent I must get rid of that. So that is I normally do by etching only, okay. Since tungsten is everywhere, it etches everywhere. So it reduces the thickness of tungsten and then I do chemical mechanical polish from this surface and tungsten just gets inside. And please remember even nitride will be removed by mechanical this. So there is a tungsten nitride and in between there is a, uh, sorry, titanium nitride in between there is tungsten block or plug as it is called. Okay. This process is actually called Damson process. Is that okay? How do I do it? H the silicon dioxide, titanium nitride, tungsten thicker, reduce thickness, do CMP, flatten it. Okay. So now I have a tungsten plug which is created here. The 
next problem in the as I said V of course as I said by ion etching contacts I did. I now want to see how to between the two metal layers uh, which dielectric I should use. Okay. Two metal layers whether it is copper or aluminum are separated by dielectric layer and called IMD. Why IMD? Intermetallic dielectric IMD. Plus if you look at an IMD structure here, this is a metal, metal and a dielectric. What it looks like? A capacitor. Okay. So now the problem starts for me. The structure is now a capacitor. So if any signal is passing on any of the transmission line, any of this metal line, let us say M1 is carrying a signal and uh, let us say the capacitance of this is such that the Z is 1 upon J omega C. Okay. If C is large enough, then Z will be smaller. If omega is large enough, Z will be smaller. So higher frequency signal and with larger C if you have, there is a connection at least at that frequency connection between metal 1 and metal 2. This is called crosstalk. Okay. This is called crosstalk. So what is the criteria I should to avoid crosstalk? Now there are many things we can try. Somehow see to it that the Z between the two metal is very high at a frequency of operation. Now to make Z very high, another problem which I am worried about, if I want to make Z high, C should be smaller. If C should be smaller, that means T should be higher. But if I use T very high, what will happen? The via connection from top to bottom, I cannot guarantee vertically down all the way deeper vias, unlikely to get same size vias. Okay. It will actually get a V groove on that, okay. the way it happens. If thickness is larger, I need deeper vias, so it is reliable tissue. Tungsten though they say that can go any conformality, but if the via size becomes smaller in the lower side, gas just goes above. It is called surface tension effect. So it does not fill, cross the surface energy there. So it does not stick to the lower side. Is that clear? So there is an air gap. Is that point clear what I said? If the via size is smaller, the gas goes in but does not touch the lower surface because there is what is called as surface tension effect which means there is no surface weighting. So the gas just goes above and does not connect with the lower ends which means there is an air gap. That means resistance of via is going to increase now because how much is air gap it depends on that. Okay. Now this issue was very tough when I started shrinking. Earlier as I say 5 micron mein sab kuch andar gaya, kuch problem mein, ab sab problem mein. So obviously I do not want to increase thickness. I wish I could but I do not want to. A is anyway increasing drastically. Why? Because interconnects are in lengthening and lengthening. So area of the capacitor is every time increasing in fact. So smaller the dimension device I make, larger interconnect lengths I am using because I want larger circuits. So more capacitance I am creating out of A. T I cannot reduce or uh, increase, A is going to increase anyway. So C to bade raha hai RB. So the only possibility left from here is to reduce epsilon. Is that correct? So to avoid some ki kind of this, increase some thickness and increase intermetallic dielectric whose epsilon is smaller. Okay. Is that point clear why back end people are worried about this? Because they find cross talks too high. Okay. Is that okay? Function wise? I want to make Z infinite or Z larger, C should be smaller, C should be smaller, A is increasing, T cannot be reduced too much. So epsilon is the only, which also I cannot play too much. What is the smallest epsilon I can get? 1. What is that? Air. So air bridge is now being tried. You are right. Okay. Here is what? Okay. Air bridge can be support. Further, as interconnects are longer, area is 2 increases the capacitor, this 2 uh, then reduces Z. 
as to avoid gross stop or to increase Z at operating frequency, we have only two options. Increase oxide thickness, but it leads to uh, more non-planar structures, deeper vias, reliability issues, non-filling of vias by metal, hence this option is uh, of limited option, it is option but limited. Second option is to use dielectric with lower epsilon, k epsilon 0. So one of the material tried was hydrogen siliciquioxane which is HSQ in short which has a dielectric constant of 2.8. How much is dielectric constant of silicon dioxide? 3.9. So at least by one insulator chai way, silicon dioxide, nitride 7 or even higher. So I want to reduce 2.8 is at least lower than silicon dioxide. So I may use this kind of a glass uh, which is an organic glass which I can put to which will slightly improve the capacitance ratios and therefore some better cross top property, not good, better and not best I want but something better. Uh, there are also now people are trying organics like uh, fluoropolymers as it is called. These are polymers uh, with fluorine, their formulas are um, too big a carbon chain so uh, benzene rings. So I thought just to show on a page lot of carbon rings does not make sense so I did not draw but it has 12 carbon chain, 2 in the one spin side, 4 in the other spin side so lot of chemistry involved. All said and done is dielectric constant is 1.8. So even better than silicon dioxide, better than HSQ. So the most likely, there is another material similar like polymer is called polymide which has a dielectric constant of 2.1. So next first we tried HSQ, then we go to polymide and now we are looking for fluoropolymers for the internal material. So what is the problem with these dielectrics? For a higher temperature and higher humidity their properties change. So their protection is very difficult so they need huge passivation on the top. Okay. HSQ, HSQ flows also, HSQ is flowing but uh, its flowing temperature is less than glass, it is 600 or something it flows. Okay. But the way it is, it is soil gel deposition, it is a gel, gel form. So you actually dip and spin, dispenser pe rakha or bhuma, that is how it is. All processes normally for polymers are soil gel, soli solution gels. So you put drops and spin, okay, that is how it is deposited. Uh, there is another material people are recently trying and to some extent successful. In 1992, one of my PhD students worked on porous silicon, actually not SiO2, porous silicon. This is also porous SiO2 as well as porous silicon, both are tried. Uh, what is porous silicon, anyone? It is not an amorphous just silicon or amorphous, this, but there are pores along the crystal line. There is no actual crystal anywhere. There is no order and there is a gaps. These are called pores. It has a very different property than yeah, yeah, some other day. We, that time we did not realize that this can be useful in VLSI. We were looking for LEDs because it will give electroluminescence. Porous silicon is used for electroluminescence. Okay, so we are looking for LED replacement from the semiconductor. So we other normal. So we were trying for porous silicon, but we only left doing a lot of theory and never made a device. So I don't know whether it gives light. Hopefully yes. So no, 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 no. The silicon is etched in a etched in a particular solution, so it gives a lot of porosity dip into the solutions. Some other time maybe I will discuss it. Okay. Tangential okay. Typical porous silicon and silicon dioxide layers have a dielectric constant around 1.2 to 1.8 which is what the best probably people will be able to achieve now. Okay. Of course the last one is air bridge. Uh, there is a method of creating pressured structure that is sealed structure in which air can be filled in between the two layers. This is called pressurized air bridges. Uh, it is a very complicated technology, it is done under vacuum, very high vacuum 10 to the power minus 16 torr, but it is very difficult to maintain. 
if small leak occurs it will just go away but it is possible to trap air in a smaller regions okay that is done through an MB machines okay that is done and it has a key of one ideal so between two metal layer only air gap okay it is doable but it is very complicated costly as if not tried. No, no, between two metal layers when I actually I put a air bridge there and then I put the next metal that is why I say MBE machines. So that there is a very tough situation but it is doable some effort have been successful but not 100 percent. So I just do not want to discuss in known as industries. Last but not the least slide for this course is this. Uh, this is another back end problem from one metal layer to the other metal layer how do I go interconnects okay. That is most important you have 9 layers 7 layers at least but 9 also can happen. So from the lower layer to upper layer or upper layer lower, how do I come down okay. So here is the method of interconnection between let us say this is my source drain one of them. This is my silicon this is my N plus then this is my IMD which is there there on IMD I have etched this window please look at it first draw it then we will discuss. Okay we have a silicon we have a source or drain N plus region I deposit IMD on that open a window this much deposit titanium nitride okay all three sides okay two sides then uh, deposit metal which is tungsten in our case either by first CVD and then by dumping and then what do I do? I do a CMP so that I get a plug okay. Then I deposit titanium nitride once again. I deposit the next layer of metal which can be aluminum or copper now okay. Then over which I have another titanium nitride please remember any metal layer should be barriered by both sides by a titanium nitride this so what you are saying vanadium vanadium plugs uh, this is occurs here exactly same as titanium nitride then uh, next plug which you want to create should not be in this directions because this oxide during if you actually open here there is a misalignment issue because you will never see this if you actually put the next contact on that. Now I can see this in my pattern and I can start looking the size where I am putting the next contact. If I use it here one is porosity issue some materials can go through. Second this contact I will not see below I, because lower side will be masked there. So if I separate them first thing I must separate them. So our next plug is again titanium nitride tungsten plug CMP another titanium nitride another metal layer another titanium nitride then the IMD in case you want to go ahead or if not you put the final passivation oxide in Chile mostly it is not oxide either it is borosilicate or phosphosilicate glass or SI3N4. The top layer of a silicon wafer is protected by silicon nitride whole wafer is coated with silicon nitride only pads are etched out. The rest whole circuit is protected by nitride. Nitride is a very hard material difficult to if you touch it scratch it it does not go below the surface. So that is why it is also it stops water molecules it also stops all kinds of impurities to go through this is a relatively thicker nitride it does not allow anything to go through it. So it is called excellent passivations. So all wafers are passivated finally the last masking is done for only pads, pad patterns okay. The rest whole chip circuit part is protected by nitrides. Then you are taking to the uh, whatever the package you want, first dice it into chips, put each dice on a uh, different kinds of uh, ceramic or metallic or whatever it is. Oh yeah, well, there are two technologies there either by wire bonding you can take from the this or there is called ball bonding. Uh, you have create a ball pattern and put flip chip. 
it is something like this. I have a metallic balls and this has the layer of actual vapor. So here is the one pad, here is another pad here. So this pad pattern is flip chipped on the ball patterns and soldered. soldered. Balls are quite thick, so they, their inductance is very low. We are more worried about in the wire, the way it is in a package. See, this is your package patterns, pads, which are actually external pins. And this is your chip. You have one pad. You wire bond here. Now, this length is not very small. So, because of that, there is sufficient inductance with this. Now, this inductance is used in RF and analog as an inductor itself because I need an inductor, it is available there. So, it is called wire inductor. But in a normal digital circuit, I do not want this to happen. Okay. So, I do not want this connection like this. I want flip chip, I will just bond it on a uh, balls. Okay. That is how I will use it. Okay. These are all vacuum sealed. But once you are passivated, both sides. Much. You just put passivation. Egg epoxy dal to sub push thick. No, generally that vacuum is released. Ho jata hai. Porous, kitna bhi ho, material is porous, vacuum is released. Kitna bhi porous. Porous ho jata hai. Okay, uh, this finishes the VLSI silicon integrated circuit VLSI course as best as we could. There are many hundreds of issues which I have not touched. I wish I could have. Uh, from your side it is good, I did not. But from my side I missed a few. 